Lord Mayor, President of the Chamber, Deputy County Mayor, Bishop Spokley Colton, Ambassador, Ministers, Public Representatives, Visitors to Cork, and my fellow Corkonians. Jur, could I thank you for your introduction? Because it's always very nice to get a good introduction from your boss. In 1987, I served on a jury, and my jury foreman was none other than Jur. And the case was very boring, but the boss was very entertaining. President, could I thank you for asking me to address the chamber dinner this evening and for giving me the perfect excuse to spend another weekend back home in this beautiful city. And for those of you visiting Cork, I'd like to tell you that this is a very special place. And I can also tell you that it is an ultra-competitive place. Our own Sean O'Feelon once said, to succeed in Cork, you need four essential attributes. The agility of a hawk, the speed of a hare, the skin of a rhinoceros, and the dissimulation of a crocodile. <laughs> and not having the speed of a hare, nor the agility of a hawk, in January of 1990, I left and went into temporary exile in the less competitive environs of Dublin. <laughs> and a minor benefit of temporary exile is that it can give you just a little more objectivity when looking at the enduring qualities of the people and the place that mean so much to you. The annual chamber dinner is one of the great business networking events in Cork, and it is also a great barometer of the mood of the county. The first chamber dinner I attended was in 1984, the era of the closure of Fords, Dunlops, Leaf Footwear, with inflation and interest rates both running at about 15%. It was a very, very dark time in the history of Cork. But even in the darkest of times, the Chamber always puts its best foot forward for Cork. And I remember very clearly that evening, for main course we were served pickled pork. That is a bit of posh alliteration for what non-Corkonians would know as bacon. <laughs> At the December 2009 dinner, I recall again very distinctly the sense of shock and indeed anger in these two halls at how suddenly and mysteriously it had all gone so wrong so quickly. Last year, there was real confidence and optimism that the recovery was beginning to take its roots in Cork and that the impossible might just be possible again. As a country and as a county, we have made enormous progress economically in the last few years, much more indeed than any one of us could have expected or imagined. And the absolute yardsticks for measuring that progress are the number of people back at work and the unemployment rate. And while this progress has been very hard earned, we must not forget that it has also been hugely facilitated by the enormously strong tailwinds of favourable exchange rates, historically low interest rates, and falling oil prices. In the last two years, the euro has fallen by 25% against the dollar and 10% against sterling giving us a huge once-off competitive pricing advantage. And a significant change in any one of these areas could have a pro profound effect on the economy, and this could happen at any time. If we, as a people, keep our house in order, and despite what some might think, this rate of job creation can continue. And I read an article in a leading newspaper recently which said, one presumes that much of the low-hanging fruit has been harvested in terms of job creation. Wrong, utterly wrong. 
and it is always dangerous to presume, and especially so in a rapidly changing world where low-hanging fruit grows much faster than any of us can ever harvest it. But it goes without saying that the newspaper in question was neither the examiner nor the echo. We should all enter 2016 in a confident, positive, but very cautious mood. Nearly eight years on from the crash, there is still some way to go before normal service is re resumed. The global economic crisis has not gone away, you know. It is still working its way through the global economy. And one of the most challenging aspects of su success is that it is not in a straight line. It's like a stairs. You climb and then you hit a platform. And you take the opportunity when you're on that platform to take stock of your situation. We are on one of those platforms. When times are relatively good, a wise person always does what a not-so-wise person is forced to do when times are not so good. And while we're on this platform, in a relatively good time, we should be wise. We do not just live in a, an open economy. We also live in an interconnected world, no longer insulated or immune from the accelerating pace of global change. The world economy is particularly volatile at present. Just look at the world's stock markets. And in the last few months, the world economy is weaker and global growth has slowed. There are a lot of global risks at large at present, and they could become very, very strong headwinds. And if we are not properly prepared, they could easily derail our recovery. All you've got to do is look at the possibility of Brexit. UK inflation is zero. It's lowest for 50 years. Germany's exports to China are slowing at their fastest pace in 21 years. Interest rates are at historical lows. And exchange rates are moving in every direction. And if you look at the recent movements in the exchange rate between sterling and euro, for a British consumer or tourist, our products are 8% more expensive than they were eight weeks ago. The message is simple. While we are currently in a relatively good place, there is not a lot to be enthusiastic about in the global economy at present and a very long list of things to be concerned about. This is not a time for complacency, raising expectations, or over-promising. The big lesson that we should all have learned from the last crash was we did not prepare ourselves for a crisis. Instead, we did the direct opposite. We prepared a crisis for ourselves. And there is always the potential for a crisis, big or small, around the next corner. We did not see it coming the last time, but we have received a second chance. And the fundamental challenge to each and every one of us is to make sure that we do not repeat the, the same mistake a second time. The world that we live in is in a state of perpetual change. It always has been, and it always will be. And if you stand still, you're guaranteed one thing. You will be overtaken. Too many people go through the motions pursuing yesterday's agenda. There is nothing we can do about yesterday, but we can all define tomorrow. And tomorrow is full of opportunity that no one can take from us except ourselves. That change is unpleasant for many, but it's the land of the opportunity for the few that want to embrace it. Change is all about staying relevant in a rapidly evolving world and something that we should all aspire to. This is Cork's opportunity. Cork should and must be a catalyst for and a writer of the rules for tomorrow. One of our enduring qualities as a people in Cork is our loyalty to one another. 
However, it can also make us a bit insular in our thinking and in slow in embracing the world outside of Cork. And we also suffer a little bit of second city syndrome. We should reach out to the world of business opportunity outside of Cork and live in it a little bit more. The recently launched action plan for jobs southwest covering Cork and Kerry is a huge opportunity for Cork businesses. This is the official bible of state agencies for job creation in Cork, covering 11 sectors and 26 action priorities. This plan also places a huge emphasis on the role of local government in job creation in Cork. Every Cork business should have a copy of this plan as it highlights the priorities and areas of opportunities for your sector and your business. And in seeking out ideas and opportunities for your business, this document must also be your Bible. Not enough Indigenous businesses in Cork have scaled up and diversified internationally. The need for diversification internationally and product-wise, while not straying too far from your core business, is critical to the long-term survival of any business. And two examples of lack of diversification at country level come to mind. In 2007, construction represented 22% of our economy when it should have been 12%. And we all know to our cost what the consequences were. Finland was one of the countries that lectured us on how to take our medicine during the crisis. Yet its own economy was not exactly built on solid foundations. In the 10 years between 1998 and 2007, one company, Nokia, represented 25% of all Finland's entire growth, 30% of its R&D spend, 20% of its exports, and 23% of its corporation tax take. Today, the Finnish people are paying the price for this lack of a diversification because Nokia's business model and technology have been rolled over by the digital revolution. When it comes to diversification, businesses are no different to countries. For decades, the rural towns and villages across our country have been in decline, no more so than in our own county here in Cork. Many of them were crushed by the economic crisis and remain utterly crushed today. Let us stop the perpetual commentary on this major social and economic issue and instead do something about it. Let us start rebuilding community life in our towns and villages in Cork, making them stronger, more vibrant and a magnet for tourists. An area of huge potential opportunity for Cork and for these towns and villages is tourism, a historical weakness in Cork. We have magnificent tourist attractions, superb people who work in every sector of the industry, but what we have lacked up to now are the proper structures and foundations upon which to build a successful tourism for all of Cork. I would be happy to see us to take on Kerry in a Munster hurling final any year, the odd year in a football final, but never ever in a Munster tourism final, unless Bishop Buckley, my former Latin teacher, says a decade of the rosary for us. And let us hope that the recently launched city and county collective strategy for tourism will provide Cork with the structures and foundations to make a game of it with our great neighbours across the county bounds. Tourism is a potential sweet spot for the entire region of Cork. We can make Cork a must-visit destination for tourists. The other potential game changer for Cork is the age of digital Darwinism. Evolution 
is smarter than any one of us, and the arrival of the digital age has and will continue to have a profound impact on the way we interact with each other and how we go about our business every day. We have entered a new age of BC and AD. This time it stands for before connectivity and after digital. Every business that wants to grow must have a digital strategy. They should also have a reverse mentoring program in place where employees under, say, the age of 35 mentor those over 35 on the opportunities in this digital world. These young people are digital natives. Few of them can remember life before the internet or how any of us operated without it. They live their lives online. Most of us live our lives offline. And in the digital age, it is essential to be close to and learn from these digitally enabled bright millennials who are full of youthful energy, zest for a different life, and who are our future. And the digital age is an age of opportunity for rural areas in Cork. Broadband and digital technology will consign geographic disadvantages to history. Living online means we can work from where we want and when we want. And I say, go for it, Cork. Make Cork the digital centre of Ireland and learn from our twin digital cities of Shanghai and San Francisco. Another one of our enduring qualities as a people is how passionate we get about things. But again, it can become a weakness when it strays into that most complex of human characteristics, our emotions. And one of the most emotive issues in Cork in 2015 was the subject of local government reform. Let me declare that I did make a personal submission to the Local Government Review Committee, and I recommended a merger of the two councils. That was my opinion but my opinion does not entitle me to be right. It was simply my opinion. But what I do believe that I am right in though is that local government in Cork is not operating at an optimal level and is in need of change, fundamental change, a point which many of us agree upon. And this means reforming systems that once worked well but no longer do so that people can keep moving forward in, in an increasingly complex and competitive world. You can never, ever build a solid structure on weak foundations. And real leaders never give up. They see a situation for what it is, not for what it was, or what they had hoped it might be. And they also know that willingness to compromise is not a, contra a contradiction to having principles, but it is the essential condition to realizing those principles. And when plan A doesn't work, they will try plan B. And if that doesn't work, they'll move on to plan C, because they never, ever give up on a core purpose. The majority of the leaders who can unlock the solution to the future of local government in Cork, whatever that solution may be, are in these two halls this evening. Our elected national and local public representatives, executives and officials of both councils, and the leaders of those businesses who provide both councils with over 40% of their annual income. As we begin a new century in our national history, we should all make a passionate plea to you, our leaders, to find a pragmatic solution to local government reform in Cork and for all of Cork. And when undertaking that core purpose and that reform, bear in mind the very wise words of Theodore Roosevelt, who said, keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. 
Could I now ask you to toast Cork Chamber of Commerce? Thank you and enjoy your evening. <laughs>